All right, if you have your Bibles, then I'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading um, in the very first verse. John chapter 8, in the very first verse, the Bible says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he'd heard them not. So, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast, uh, let him cast a stone at her. And he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even into the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we pray tonight because we stand in need of help. Lord God, we uh, stand in your need to preach your word, Lord, and we stand... Uh, in, in need to live by it more and more as the days go by, Lord, we understand how, how inadequate and unworthy we really are. Lord God, we pray for the lost. That's the biggest need of the hour, Lord, that you might save. Lord, that you with mercy and grace look down and, and speak life to the deadness of, of a sinner, Lord. What a rejoicing thing that would be. How, how wonderful, glorious it would be if we could see someone saved. Lord, we pray tonight that you would um, wake ourselves up to the truths of your word, Lord, that we might see you high and lifted up. Lord, remember our neediness before you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this, this evening on the thought, the one that cast the stone. The one that cast the stone. And... Uh, you say, well, nobody cast a stone. Well, there was one there that could have, but he didn't. There was one there that had the authority to do it, but he didn't. Now, we'll go back to the very first part. It says that Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Now, that's kind of a, just a break between these two uh, recordings of the gospel. And what he had really been teaching them previously was what a Pharisee was about. Uh, he even uh, had a little, uh, he, he, they, they were ready to stone him then. They wanted to get him on something. Now, a Pharisee is this, who enjoys doing the law, enjoys keeping the law, and letting everyone know about it. That is a Pharisee. And you know what? We have an ever-growing multitude of Pharisees, even in the modern day. We think the Pharisee as a Jew, and, and, and that's been set aside. No, no, I've seen a lot of Pharisaical Baptists that think they are the only ones to know how to do anything. And when we get to that point, we're wrong. When we get to that, listen, none of us know, knows, <coughs> knows it all. Now let me say also concerning the Pharisees is they were really hung up on the law. That's a resurgent in the modern day. If you don't think that people are hung up on the Jewish law, look around you. You know what? The Bible does say this, we're Jews by adoption. But you know what? It has... The Bible also says this, if you do part of the law, you're a debtor to do all of the law. Uh, what the Bible say concerning the law of itself? It is our schoolmaster. It teaches us what sin is. So this pharisaical attitude is not dead. It still exists. It's still around. It's still about us on a routine basis that we think we're better than someone else. Jesus went out of the Mount of Olives, 
And early in the morning he came again into the temple. Now probably he was going to the time of morning prayer about 6 a.m. And he got to the temple and he begins to teach them. Now notice what it says, and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. Now let me say this, this was the chug of the whole thing. They were jealous of Christ. They, they, it wasn't the fact that he just had people, uh, if he came down to the temple and no one paid any attention to him, they wouldn't have had an issue with it. They really didn't even have an issue with what he was teaching. Their issue was this, is that people were listening and understanding and learning. That, that was the issue. And they saw that their gig was kind of going to be up, upset things down at the temple. So when Jesus arrived, this group, this group began to listen to what he was saying. Now notice again, verse 3, the scribes, the ones that were the letter writers, the ones that recopied the law again and again and again and again, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Master or teacher, huh, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things about that. First of all, I want you to see that they, they put her right in the middle of the situation. Uh, you have this sinner, this sinner woman in the very center of the law. And you know what? If you're lost this evening, you're a lost individual in the very center of the law. You know, as vile as it would seem, she was in a good place. She was in a place where she could learn what she had done was wrong. Now, we always think about this and we always mention it. You know, where was the man that was involved? It takes two people to have an adulterous relationship, right? It takes a man and it takes a woman. And they drag the woman in and the man is off scot-free. And I've, I've preached a lot of sermons on that. But listen, you know who the fortunate one really was? It was the woman. You know why? Because she heard from Jesus. She heard what she had done was wrong. And no more than that, she was forgiven. That man went on the best that we understand. That man went on and on and on and on and on in his sin and never ever repented. So you know what? When your sin is exposed, it is a good thing. You know, salvation is near when sin is exposed. <coughs> Because you'll never see yourself needy of a Savior until you, know you know that you're sinful. You will never see yourself as in need of redemption if you don't know that you're a slave. You'll never see yourself in that situation unless God brings you there. So as she's drug in by the law bearers himself and thrown before Christ... She was in no better place than she possibly could be. In fact, you know what a wonderful thing it would be tonight if someone that's lost would become understanding of that condition and just drug by the law to understand what sin is. When you begin to understand that you're against God in every way, you're not far from salvation. You're not far from salvation. It, it, it's, it's a good thing when we begin to understand really how vile we really are. And, and what I think I see more as time goes by is that I, I think I understand how vile I am now better than I used to, which would seem backwards, but you understand that. And they say to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now again, uh, two things. What about the man? And what about these supposedly godly priest? Why didn't they intervene before it got to that situation? If I was a Levitical priest and I saw something going awry, I'd be like, listen, y'all don't, y'all, you need to go that way, you need to go, go that way. It's you fix it in the mess. You know, there, there should have been some warning there. But no, they all they wanted was to accuse the Lord Jesus Christ. And we live in a day and age today. And I say this, when religion, all they want to do is accuse the Lord Jesus Christ. All this works-based salvation, all it says, the whole lump sum, Jesus, you're not enough. Yeah. And you can put the baptism and the church membership or the Jewish law or whatever you want to wrap all that up into. 
And all you're really saying is your life wasn't enough. Your death wasn't enough. And your, and your uh, resurrection, it wasn't enough. I need to do something else. And so we see then that the Jewish men uh, really had not much compassion on anybody. And, he, and he, they throw this naked woman right in the midst of it and say, what are we going to do with her? Verse uh, uh, 5, Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Now, that's, that's a good question for you because it's really easy to get up on our little high Baptist high horse and when we see something going on and, and, and oh, you know, I would never do that. Well, you be careful when you begin to say, I'll never do that because you might be the one involved in it, very, the, the next one that we hear about. You know, they were Pharisaical people. The Jews were Pharisees through and through. But I've seen a lot of Baptist Pharisees too in my lifetime. And we certainly don't need that among our people. And so we see, we see that they, they wanted to condemn her. They wanted to bring her down. They wanted her to kill, to be killed. And on top of that, they wanted Jesus' stamped approval on it. And so they brought the case toward him. This said that this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. Now, why, why would that have worked? Because if they were all about law, and Jesus says, yeah, go stone her, you know what it says. That should have been okay, right? But the thing he had taught them was this, that the law pointed towards sin. It outlined sin. And he was teaching them forgiveness. So if he just said, yeah, stone her, they'd have come right back and said, well, you said the other day, you forgive her. They, they wanted to try to catch him in something. And, and that's, the, that's the modern day, you know what? If you can't take this blessed old book and search it out, you don't need a commentary. You don't need, you don't need Spurgeon's notes. You don't need to know what the, Jew, the Hebrew is. And you don't need to know what the Greek is. There is all we need. Yeah. Right there. And it, you know what? If you have to search through and, and, and define words to validate yourself, maybe you're not teaching what you think you are. We need to be very cautious of that. And I, I, I see that more and more in the modern age. is people developing books. To promote what they say they believe. Instead, we need to just stick with the Bible and what and the Bible alone. And so they brought it, they brought him up there, kind of brought it to a to a head. Now notice what he says. And they and this they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now you talk about making somebody mad. He pretended like he didn't even hear them. See, I've known a lot of people like that, haven't you? That they're going to get their attention and they're going to... You know, that, that's why you need to be careful with your youngins while they're little. You know what? If one of mine was trying to be all demanding and in my face, I'd swap their tail and go put them in the room. And i said, when I get ready, I'll come to you. See, they wanted an answer right now. You know, sometimes you just ain't going to get an answer. And sometimes you might get one, but it may be 20 or 30 years down the road. You don't demand things from God. So the Lord Jesus pretends like He didn't even hear them. And in fact, He stooped down and began to write something. Now, I, I would love, and I guess when I get to glory, it won't matter no more, but I would, I'd love to know what He wrote, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it was, <laughs> I've often wondered if it was, I forget. That's all he had to write, was it not? That's all. That's all. That's all what it took. Uh, it would be an amazing thing. I, I think when I get there, I'll be so overcome with the person of Christ. It really won't matter anymore. But but what what a wonderful knowledge to know what he wrote on the on the ground before those people. Verse seven. So they continued asking him. So they kept pushing the point. You know, you know what the devil is doing today? He's pushing the point. You know what? Uh, you, if you're caught up in sin, he's going before the Lord God just like he did in, 
uh, when he was there before Job and saying, look a there, look a there, look a there. See, the devil likes to make demands that he can't keep. You know what? That's the problem of our meaning theology is this. We can't demand nothing from God. Yeah. And they were demanding an answer. And, and <laughs> it came like you even hear You know what that says to me? God heals only who He will. Right? And so they just thought they'd get louder and mean. Have you ever had a, a rebellious child and they think their answer to everything just to say it louder? Say it, say it in a different way. That, that, that was their approach. Now, listen to us. Listen to us. She was taken in adultery in the very act. They were demanding something from him. So notice what he says. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, he did two things in here. The first one, he validated the law. You ever think about that? He really did. He says, you're right. The law does say to stone. So he says, if you don't have any sin in your life, stone her. Matthew's account of the very same one says this. Ye that be without sin, let him cast the first stone. That's Matthew's wording of the very same events. Now, they done had their rocks ready to go. And I say nine times out of ten, we have our rock ready to go. Look at, look, setting our sights on people. Yeah. You know what? They not all not ever be named among God's people. Right. Do I believe church, in church discipline? Sure I do. But listen, you don't need to go with a barrel gun. And you know, on top of that, when that has to be done, you know what discipline's for? The Bible says it's that their soul may be preserved. You do it as a last resort. You don't do it as a means of keeping things your way. And, and so, he, he, yeah, he validates the law, and at the same time he says, you review yourself. You, if you have no sin, you be the one to cast the stone. So that required self, a self-look at self, a review of self to see where you're at and what you're doing. And, and that would be my advice to you tonight. You need to look at yourself really, really carefully. You need to be sure that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know that you've been born again, that you're saved, and you understand what redemption is about. You understand what the blood of Jesus was all about. You need to review that very carefully. That's what he was saying. You look at yourself. And you know what? Those of us that are redeemed and, that, and, that, and those of us that are saved, we need to do the same thing. We really do. I believe that's key in making your calling and election sure. Don't you? You know what I have found? Safe people like to be in the house of God. And yeah. lost people don't. If you, have them, if you have to drag them to church, leave them at home. Sounds kind of, kind of cold, don't it? But I found that to be to be the best policy, and, and so we see then we see then as he's uh, uh, and he says search your in other words he says search yourself out look if you don't have any sin you cast the first stone and then you think about the day the Lord saved your soul I was saved as a twelve year old boy and you you know what besides being one of God's people. There were things that I did after I was redeemed that I'm more ashamed of than that what I did before I was redeemed. So you know what? I can't cast a stone. I just can't do it. And you can't either. You just can't do it. But we began to meet out and like, well, you know, she did this and she did that and blah, 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 blah. No. The sweetest words I ever heard were I forget. 
And, and, and so we see as they're ready with all their stones and they're about ready to do it. He says, you think about yourself. You look within yourself. You search yourself out. You look at yourself. And if you think you're worthy, you cast the first stone at her. You've been the one to throw the first rock. And the thing it is, at least the Jews had this honesty. They all walked away. Right. Now I believe in the modern day, I know some good sovereign grace by this. It probably let the stones fly. Because they really think they're that good. Ought not to be named among God's people. You know that? It ought not to be named among God's people. And so we see, we see that they put the rocks down. Verse 9, and, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. Now, I want you to look at verse 9 because it, it's often left out today. And that is the work of conviction. Now, what, do, what, what does that say? It says convicted of their own conscience or their own thoughts or their own review. You know, that kind of conviction won't do you much. You say, well, I kept that woman alive. Well, in one sense, yes. But see, if it's not Holy Ghost conviction, it'll wane and it'll go away. And, they, and you'll be back right in the same shape that you were. Does that make sense? You, you, you'll, be, you, you'll be ready to stone her on the next morning. And so we find then in, in that that people lack conviction today. You know one of the worst problems with agreeing and saying some kind of stupid prayer? It leaves no room for the Holy Ghost. Right. And it puts salvation up here is logic instead of a work of, of the redeeming grace of God. That is the problem. Take these little ones and say, do you want to go to hell when you die? I mean, who's going to say, yeah, that'd be great. Let's go. That's stupid. And lose role. But you know what? What you're really doing is you're taking the place of the Holy Ghost. And you're scaring them into something. And you're, you're forcing them. And say, listen, we don't need to force nothing. We've got the Holy Ghost of God. And so, this woman, these people, they, they were convicted of their self. They, when, when, when they began to look at the situation, they began to review the situation, they were convicted in and of themselves. And that's a good thing, but it won't last long. So you can turn back to your own salvation and your own redemption time and the, your, your, when the Lord saved you. And did you have conviction or not? Were you convicted of God or were you convicted of man? Did you, did you just feel guilty or did, the, or did the Lord bring you along? And so these men went their way because they knew where they were at. The end part of verse 9. Even unto the last, Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst or the middle. Now, this is the next thing people who have truly been born again will understand this. Just being left alone with Christ. You know what these big mega meat and Billy Graham things it don't leave much room for being alone, does it? Right. Nothing wrong if the Lord saved you to be camp meeting, glory to God. But, you better look at your time alone. And more so than that, you better be sure you have some time alone with Him. You know what, people that can't tell me that they should cherish their prayer time? I don't have much confidence in it. Yeah. And you say, oh, you're judging. No, no, I'm not judging. I just know this, that huh, I love Donna and I spend time with her. And if you love Christ, you, 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 you'll want to spend some time alone with Him. When it's just you and Him and nobody else. But now, if your redemption's come by somebody pushing you and pressurizing you, that alone time means nothing to you. You don't even know what I'm talking about, right? 
And, and, and so we see then that th this special on time, all the convictors were gone, and the only righteous, the only one that really could have cast a stone, the only one that, that really had the authority to say, you're guilty, you die, she's standing there along with him. And you know what, this morning, this evening, that the only person that can say, you're guilty, you deserve to die, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we find a merciful Savior in that. What, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. He, he is so good to us. Verse 10, Jesus, when Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman, and he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? And no man condemned thee? Now I want you to notice there's two things that everybody says. Things are the same. First of all, he says, where's your accusers? Where are your accusers at? Who's your accuser? I tell you who mine is. It's, it's Satan. He's my accuser. And every time I fail, and every time I mess up, and every time I let the Lord down, I know he goes before me and says, you look at Larry, what he's done this time. He's my accuser. Amen. You say, well, that's foolish. We did it with Job. Mm -hmm. like Job's the only one that's ever had that experience to you. And I'm not talking about the trials of Job. I'm just talking about God saying, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. Though. You know what? He could be doing that for you tonight. And, and what was the accuser's uh, reply to that? Does Job serve thee for naught? Has thou not built a hedge about him? And, and you know the rest of the, how that fell out. So we find here... That the accusers were gone. That there was nobody left there to say, to say anything. The Jews were being her accusers and saying, look. And then notice what he says, hath no man condemned thee. Now if you think about a court of law, number one, the accusation would be, this woman committed adultery. We saw her, she was with a man over there, and we pulled him out of the bed, and here she is. That was the accusation. Now, the condemnation would have been this, guilty. Stoner, be done with it. Guilty, guilty, guilty. She's guilty. Stoner. See, Christ took care of both, didn't he? He took care of the, of the accuser and the condemners. See, that's what Christ would do for you. Amen. That's what Christ would do for you. Take care of, take care of both the problems. And so, uh, now they're standing there alone and he's asking her, Notice what she said. She said, No man, Lord. <laughs> you remember a, a, another fellow that said that? Yeah. Old Paul on the road, road to Damascus. Who art thou, Lord? And here we find her. <laughs> no man, Lord. Nobody's here. See, somewhere between being thrown out before him. And all those people walked away. She saw the answer in Christ. She saw Him as her Savior. She saw Him as the one that took away the penalty of the law. She saw Him as her Redeemer. And so, He says, where are your accusers? Where are thine accusers? Where are they? No man, Lord. No man. Nobody's here. What a, what a wonderful... Glorious thing when, when we can say that as people. When, when, when we can be, when we can say there's nobody that can, can bring that against me anymore. Woman, were those thine accuser? Had no man condemned thee? She said, no, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto, her, uh, said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, he gave her a tall bill to fill. He says, I don't condemn you. You go. You're forgiven. And don't sin no more. Now, he was giving her some good teaching. But was that really a possibility? No. She still had this stuff to deal with just like you and I had to deal with it every stinking day. You ever thought about this woman? <laughs> she had to go home somewhere, didn't she? That's right. 
And since she was taken in adultery, so to be taken in adultery, she had an old man somewhere. A husband, right? <laughs> she had to go home. You think this got out about Jerusalem pretty quickly? It's better than News Channel 5. And she had to go home and fess up. You know what? When we're redeemed, it doesn't change the, the, how the sin is going to impact our lives. And you know what? That stuff in your mind, as though you want it to, it will never, ever, ever go away. That's right. Amen. Y'all like to do quizlets on Facebook? Justin's saying no. It might test your intelligence, Justin. Uh, I was doing one the other day, and I'm ashamed to tell you this. I just give you a good example. It'll never go away. It was on the, on popular songs of the 1980s. Best quiz that I've ever done, a 97%. You know what? It will never get out of my mind. And this would always be with her. Was she forgiven? Sure she was. Did she belong to Christ? You betcha. But you know what? She had to live with that adultery the rest of her life. Sin will hamper you. Sin will hinder you. Sin will cause problems on, your, on, a, on a routine basis in your life. So, <laughs> I bet she, she left there and she was never the same. Think about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. What does she leave there saying? Come see a man that's told me everything I've ever done. Yeah. And she was rejoicing in it. See, what, we, what you need to know is do you really know Christ? Do you know Him or do you know about Him? When the Lord saved you, are you a, you know, everybody's salvation events is different. But I would be very weary if I couldn't tell somebody about it. Wouldn't you? You know, you know one of the one of the chief things about Armenian teaching is this. Well, he just saved me. Well, you know, that really minimizes what Christ did, did he not? He brought new life to me again. He, he breathed into a dead creature. And I'm here among you today because he saved me. You know what? That's a huge difference in what, you know, deciding that you, want a Jesus, that you want Jesus. Listen, if you had a decision to make, you'd make the wrong one, and so would I. The thing is, is do you know Christ? You know what I would do? And I do this routinely because my Bible teaches me to do it, is to make my calling and election sure, because I want to be sure that I know the Lord Jesus Christ. And you think about right now, at this moment, where the Lord saved you, and if you had an active role in that, even as simple as walking down an aisle, if you think you had something to do with it, you know what? I dare say you probably don't have what you think you do. Because it's all of Him. You know, uh, this man right here said something. Me and I don't even married yet. The way it's at Bunkus Mills Church. And it stuck with me for 30 years. The devil will slip you a counterfeit. And I found that to be true. But now I will have to say this. What I've seen in 30 years since then, counterfeits are always exposed. May take a little time, but they are always, always, always exposed. Do you really know the Lord? Yeah. Have you had an experience like this woman did? Should be your desire. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Yeah. All right.